Among its many missions, the U.S. military also operates a system of schools that provide professional military education, or PME, to rising leaders in each service. Today's guest has charted a new path for the U.S. Naval War College at a time of historic global challenges. He's Rear Admiral Jeffrey A. Harley this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. This show is about the narratives and stories that shape public understanding of important issues. Joining us this week is a man who is both a warfighter and a thinker. Rear Admiral Jeff Harley is the 56th president of the U.S. Naval War College in Newport. Admiral, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank so you. So for our audience that might not know, tell us basically what is the Naval War College? So the Naval War College was created in 1884, and it's been the uh, principal home of thinking for our United States Navy uh, ever since its creation. It's really much more than a college with an educational throughput of students. We're really a global command. So we have on any given day, we'll have uh, professors and operators in Indonesia. We'll have professors teaching courses in the Middle East. We'll have advise and assist teams serving to monitor exercises to ensure fleet readiness. And of course, we'll be conducting war gamings and tabletop exercises, world-class researchers who testify before Congress, and we'll of course have our uh, 600 student throughput uh, receiving the uh, education that's uh, one of a kind in the world. So tell us a little bit about the people, both from the, who are the students? Uh, I know it's both foreign and U.S., uh, and who, who are your faculty? Sure, so the students are about 610 uh, students uh, make up the student body. Uh, we have a junior course of mid-level officers and a more senior course of, of around the uh, commander and captain level in the Navy and the lieutenant colonel and colonel level in the other services. Uh, one out of every six students is an international student uh, sent from among the very best throughout the world. Uh, and they have an incredible record of, of becoming uh, flag officers or their heads of Navy in the future, and this gives us an incredible global outreach through an alumni network that treasures this world-class education. The professors are world-class educators, uh, educated by uh, the, in the best universities throughout the world. Uh, we have a mix of military faculty and civilian faculty, and their principal job, the principal focus of our institution is educating and developing future leaders with a principal thread of war fighting, a thread of history, a thread of strategy and policy, and a thread of leadership and ethics. So obviously it's not just naval offices who attend, it's all branches of the U.S. services, as, as you've mentioned. Why the international component? I think that will perhaps surprise some of our audience who are not intimately familiar with the Naval War College who might think it's just U.S. In fact, it's 66, 67 foreign nations represented. Why do that? What is the purpose of that? Well, I think it gives a, a, a global outreach as a function of having those connections, especially with the alumni. I think it brings great value to the U.S. students as well because our international students are integrated into the classroom. So we hear more than the American perspective in the classroom. So we get to share uh, these international ideals and uh, have dialogues that we wouldn't have otherwise. So it's really important to have the international students there. Uh, and in in the future, uh, as they become heads of Navy of their service, uh, provides an even greater integrating function for our senior naval leadership as well. There's there's some remarkable statistics about your alumni too, in terms of the the, the number of uh, foreign chiefs of naval 
service around the world who are graduates of the U.S. Naval War College. Am I right about oh, that? Absolutely. So uh, statistically, uh, uh, almost half of the international students become flag officers, which is an extraordinary feat in itself. And within that number, about a third become heads of Navy or heads of Coast Guard. So it's an incredible record. And it's, it's not because of their Naval War College education, it's because the international uh, nations choose to send their very best to Newport, Rhode Island to go to the U.S. Naval War College for the contributions that both can make to each other. So in addition to the former relationships, the, the student enrollments from all of these countries, and I want to get to some of those countries in, in a second here, there must be sort of friendships or connections or personal networks that are formed that can be valuable going forward in terms of international relations. I mean, talk about that. People are people, and so if you're together for a year, you're studying, but you're also connecting. Right, and the international students do a, a number of, of staff rides or field trips uh, throughout the nations, which give uh, our uh, our student population, those international students, a chance to see what America is truly like. And throughout the course of that bonding that takes place not only through the education and the seminars and the dialogues that take place and these individual trips throughout the United States, uh, they form close relationships with people that would seem uh, unnatural otherwise. So we'll have Israeli students uh, interacting with Arab counterparts. Uh, we'll have uh, the Indian student interacting with the Pakistani student. And so what our national level political enmity are often uh, bridged over because of a personal relationship that can be established at the U.S. Naval War College and it's very special to watch. I'm curious about, you mentioned the, the, some, of the, some of the curriculum. Uh, and you mentioned history. Now, I'm a historian by training, uh, and history I think is an incredibly useful tool, but w why is it so important to the, to the Navy and to the U.S. military more generally? Well, you know, uh, we have a requirement, it's one of our, our missions, uh, to shape effective decision making through an understanding of history. And so uh, understanding a history of the relationship between a nation's policy and then its military strategy is critical to developing critical thinking skill sets. We recently stood up the Hattendorf Historical Center uh, designed to do exactly that so that it's more than a recitation of, of historical facts, that instead it's using history and the knowledge that can be gained there to influence decision making for future decisions. So what are some of the foreign nations, just a handful that, that our audience, the, you know, the civilian audience might not expect to have sent or be sending students to Newport, the Naval War College? I think probably the, the most unique uh, would be Taiwan uh, as a representative of uh, one China policy. Uh, in the past, we've had Russian students. Really? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but we're represented pretty well throughout the world uh, in terms of who is able to actively participate in both our junior and senior course. In fact, within the college, we have a specific college dedicated to the junior international students and to the senior international students. I, I know when, when I interviewed you for the Providence Journal this past summer, uh, you talked about how many of these foreign students go back to their, their countries and almost open um, like a Harvard club or you know a Naval War College club in Argentina or whatever, you know, where alumni get together. Is that alumni association continuing and, and important in these? It's incredibly strong. So every two years, the Navy in its entirety hosts an International Sea Power Symposium and the next one is in September of next year. Uh, and that's where the, the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations hosts all of the heads of Navy and Coast Guard throughout the world at your U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And there'll be a thematic discussion about uh, cooperation or strengthening partnerships uh, on a, a theme that changes each and every time we do it. But between the International Sea Power Symposiums, we conduct regional alumni symposiums. So just uh, two weeks ago, we held a regional alumni symposium in Muscat, Oman, uh, hosted by the chief of the 
Royal Navy of Oman. Uh, and it was extraordinary to bring together all of the former alumni of the U.S. Naval War College to have regional issues discussed uh, in an open forum to bring in our world-class faculty uh, to be able to continue a lifelong learning process, but most importantly, to continue those ties. Before that, several months ago, uh, we met in Peru and did the same thing from, for every country in North and South America. And the Peruvians are very special, and most of the international alumni uh, of, the, of the college uh, really treasure the education that they get here in Newport. In Peru, for example, every month the alumni get together from 04 uh, up through the flag ranks, and they meet once a month to have breakfast to talk about their experience, to talk about the critical thinking that we've helped to imbue in them so that they can discuss this, these critical issues amongst themselves. Do you find, um, so when I think about the sort of the history of the U.S. Navy, particularly since the sort of emergence of the United States as a global power at the start of the 20th century, um, one of the critical roles that the Navy has played is protecting access to the global commons, particularly the seas. And, 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 and when you think about the 21st century, is that still where uh, the Navy's principal mission is gonna arrive from, protecting and the, both freedom of the, of the global commons and, and the ability to navigate those global commons, whether it's the seas or now cyber or even the heavens? So I think that the principal mission of our great Navy today is to execute a war fight if tasked by our commander in chief. We also seek to deter conflict and we provide one of the five elements of sea power is maritime security. Mm -hmm. And maritime security is more important than ever before. If you look at the statistics of the, the billions and billions of goods that transit through the sea lanes every day, most of the items that make it through and in, in our hands traveled by sea, traveled through those maritime sea lanes, and there are nations that are challenging the international order of the sea lanes today. Uh, and so the Navy, our Navy and like-minded navies, partners and allies throughout the world, uh, work together to ensure the security of those sea lanes, and that's why we call it maritime security. So we, we are witnessing the growth and the rise of both China and Russia as Navy powers. I mean, they have been to an extent, varying extents in history in the past. How do you at the college and, and, and what you teach and study there assess each of those? And I guess we could start with China. Our president, as we speak, is on an Asian tour and will be going to China. That, I know that's an area of research for the Naval War College. What can you tell us about that? Well, so we do study China and we do study Russia. We uh, certainly focus on war fighting at the War College. We also look at the constructs of peace, particularly deterrence and uh, the other elements of national power. Uh, so in that context, you would expect us to study uh, potential competitors or near peer competitors. Uh, we work very closely with our student body to ensure that we inculcate an understanding of, of the Chinese systems and the Chinese military writ large. Um, we do the same for Russia. So we have two research organizations, a China Maritime Studies Institute uh, that very deeply studies the references that come out of China. This last year we stood up a Russia Maritime Studies Institute that tries to achieve the same end. And to that end these people provide world-class research uh, at an international and national level. They'll testify before Congress based on their expertise. Uh, we'll conduct gaming uh, so that we can best understand the military capabilities of all the different nations in the world and how those integrate together to ensure our success if we ever got to a place where we had to have conflict. But principally, uh, we're seeking to ensure that we can deter a conflict. But if that day comes, we will fight and win in that conflict because of the efforts that are made at your U.S. Naval War College. We need to take, take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. We're produced each week by a remarkably talented crew at Rhode Island PBS in Providence, Rhode Island. We owe them a lot of thanks. If you're listening to us on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, then you're listening to the POTUS Channel 124. You can catch us three times each weekend there and anytime on the Sirius XM app.
I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island, or neighbors of, 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 of sort, sir. Uh, you can catch up with me on Twitter at J. M. Lutus. My co-host and friend is an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and an author of 17 books. G. Wayne Miller is also on Twitter, at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is the 56th president of the U.S. Naval War College, Rear, Rear Admiral Jeff Harley. Admiral, um, so you mentioned uh, uh, China, and uh, this, so there's been a lot of attention paid in the media in the last several years about China's island building uh, process in the South China Sea. Um, when you look at that particular challenge, and literally China's changing the geography uh, and, and the reality on the ground there, um, how does the U.S. Navy respond? How does uh, the international community respond to literally, as I said, changing the geography? Well, there are a number of claims uh, to the various islands in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, but simply because the word China is used in the name of those seas does not mean that there's a, a territorial uh, ability to build new islands. And so, in fact, when someone talks about island building, it's really a misnomer. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea precludes the building of constructs which would then entitle a nation to the international law rights like territorial seas. So one of the issues that exists as we sort through uh, this complex relationship with China uh, is the fact that they are manufacturing artificial islands and then attempting to claim the international law uh, um, artifices that go with that. So. Uh, within the, our ability and that of the international community, when we look at the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, that although the United States is not a signatory, we do honor it. Uh, China is a signatory, but chooses not to honor it. Uh, and the issue becomes uh, with the uh, maritime security issues that we discussed, is the free transit mm -hmm. of goods and materials throughout that part of the world. And moreover, it, it is designed perhaps uh, to give them a military advantage um, that is in violation of the constructs of the United Nations. Does the fact that the United States is not a signatory to the, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea impact our ability to deal with this issue? Well, I think everyone knows that we, like most of the international community, uh, honor the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and so, you know, this is a matter of principle, but it's also a matter of law. And so you saw recent court cases, the International Tribunal, uh, over some of the disputes between the Philippines and China, and the adjudication that came out of that in favor of the Philippines, mm -hmm. and by, in, by virtue of being in favor of the Philippines, was in accordance with the Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this is a fundamental challenge uh, within the international order today, and one that we must work together to find a resolution to. Do you think that China will ultimately respect that court ruling? They have said that they are not going to respect that court ruling. Uh, from their perspective, their ability to expand their own territorial reach and their military projection uh, is greatly enhanced by the uh, creation, uh, but they are doing severe environmental damage, uh, not in compliance with uh, this Convention on the Law of the Sea, and they attempt to restrict the access to the seas around those artificial islands. So what you have is the United States Navy and many, if not most, of all the other nations in the world uh, saying that the international order is founded upon free transit. And so what we do is we transit anywhere we believe we need to in accordance with international law. Uh, and China is attempting to restrict that in those specific areas. It's, it's one of the tender spots between the two nations that needs to be resolved. And I think over time, uh, if we can avoid a place, uh, it's called the Thucydides Trap, mm -hmm. where rising powers uh, develop a capability and then contest uh, the existing international norms. Uh, but it's a significant challenge that would be devastating to both nations and the global economy. So it is an issue that we have to work together on a diplomatic front. 
So to use your term, another tender spot uh, that is certainly coming up in the president's trip to Asia is North Korea. What is the Navy's role, I mean, as best you can, without <laughs> revealing classified information, what, what is the Navy's role in that whole situation, sort of in a general sense? The sense? So I think the Navy fights as a joint force. So we have a lot of forces on the Korean Peninsula in support of our allies, uh, the South Korean forces. Uh, and so we fight as a joint force. So we'd be integrated within that joint force. Um, there's certainly a lot of discussion of the role of the joint force that in particularly includes the Navy in ballistic missile defense, uh, since that in particular is is what seems to be the North Korean goal is to develop ballistic missiles capable of striking the United States. And the Navy, in concert with the other forces in the United States, uh, are determined uh, to provide the defense of our homeland as required. Uh, additionally, I think that uh, you know, on a, on a number of other fronts of the elements of national power, we can contribute uh, through our diplomatic efforts, not so much with the North Koreans, but maintaining our partners and alliances in the region, particularly with our strongest alliance with Japan, uh, and that, of course, with our war fighting partners in Korea, South Korea. What about some of the new technologies in maritime warfare that are being developed or under consideration? I know that a lot of attention is being paid to underwater drones, but there are also advances in, in cyber warfare related to the Navy and to other military preparedness. Can you talk about that? I mean, obviously this is an area that, that you folks study down at the Naval War College. Sure. In, in fact, in this last year, one of our uh, particular goals has been to futurize our curriculum to reflect on emerging technologies and how they affect the strategic battle space. So we have looked at the emerging, uh, the continued emerging role of space. We are looking at cyber. In fact, we've tripled the amount of curriculum dedicated to the study of cyber and cyber warfare. We do look at unmanned systems and its impact uh, in the strategic environment. Uh, we also look at uh, the leadership and ethical issues associated with some of these emerging technologies. But part of my goal uh, as president is ensuring the relevancy of the U.S. Naval War College. And we're doing that through uh, maintaining our interface with the fleets, through operationalization, through further navalization uh, of the college, so that in addition to teaching joint principles, we also view those joint principles through a maritime lens and have a better understanding of issues like sea control and maritime security. Uh, we're continuing to futurize our curriculum so that we can maintain our understanding of the exponential rise in technology. Uh, we are internationalizing our curriculum to continue to strengthen those global partnerships that are absolutely required for any future war fight. We principally don't fight as an individual nation. We fight as coalitions and partners and alliances. Uh, and then we are working to normalize the college. Uh, and, and by that I mean simply that uh, we are an extraordinary institute for war fighting, extraordinary institution of war fighting. And yet at the same time, uh, we should aspire to have some of the traits of some of the Ivy League schools so that we can continue to attract the world's best faculty and retain them. So, so talk just a little bit about that. I know that is a component of the uh, new strategic plan that you led and is being implemented now. And you refer to the, the War College as a university. And you made the comparison here to Ivy League schools or other schools. Scholarship, original scholarship, even if it doesn't necessarily tow the Pentagon line, is encouraged and supported. Am, am I correct in that? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I think we're the best university system in the world. And the only difference between a college and a university is, of course, the university has an incredible research arm. And as I discussed about our global capabilities, our global outreach, the incredible research that we do, the International Law Center, the Historical Center, the contributions that we make above and beyond educating developing future leaders would put us in the category of a university. Of course, we're the U.S. Naval War College. We retain that name. Uh, it's a very 
special place uh, for uh, th this particular type of education, principally focused on war fighting. Uh, but as we compare ourselves to Ivy League schools, and those are the schools that we compete for to have a world-class faculty, uh, we would like to have uh, similar foundations in terms of things like tenure, in terms of things like compensation. Uh, and that's what I mean when we want to be like an Ivy League school. We are as good or better than any Ivy League school, but we need the constructs founded in law that enable us to compete. So, sir, you've you've spent uh, your uh, adult life in service to the United States. Uh, you've served Democrat and Republican presidents. Uh, you became president of the War College in the Obama administration. You continue to serve now in the Trump administration. For folks who are at home who sort of watch politics and and from a distance, uh, I'm curious. Someone who is uh, at the pointy end of the spear, as it were. Uh, has has the has anything about the war college changed with the change in administrations? Has anything about the types of things that you're emphasizing? Is there any sort of material difference between 2016 and 2017? So we, of course, swear our allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, and our Commander-in-Chief is the President of the United States. Uh, so we execute the orders, as you would expect good military people to do. Uh, there's no trouble of conscious, conscious, uh, conscience in doing that. Um, I don't think there's been a, a particular shift as a function of the administration. Our, guidance is principally formed for us by our great Secretary of the Navy uh, and through our Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, we maintain our focus on war fighting and the other constructs of peace like deterrence. Uh, we are working hard to maintain the relevancy of the college in a world where technology is changing so rapidly that it affects the strategic environment almost uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so although there are higher level politics, of course, uh, you know, we remain focused on ensuring that we deliver the critical thinking skill set and the war fighting capability uh, that our uh, students require, and that would be my duty to deliver. Well, it, it is a remarkable institution, and uh, Admiral Jeff Harley, we thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, he's Rear Admiral Jeff Harley, President of the U.S. Naval War College, and we want to thank all of you, too, for joining us this weekend. If you'd like to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit PellCenter.org, where you can also watch previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.